Okay, so recall from last class we were talking about priority queues. Uh, we know that there were a few different ways that you might want to implement a priority queue. Um, three of the methods actually use a queue data structure. Uh, so the simplest is that for every priority level, you would have its own separate queue. This works if your priority levels are really low, if you have some constant bound on, on how many priority levels you have. In general, you won't necessarily know how many priority levels you have, or there's a lot of them. And so what you're going to do is you're going to mix in uh, different items with their priority level. So we're now storing a tuple or two values, both a, what's called the key and what's called the value. So the value is your actual data, and the key is the priority level. And we can um, just put this into a queue in unsorted order. And then when we dequeue, we want to find the minimum key. And so we're going to have to walk the list. And so that's going to take linear time. Alternatively, in some cases, um, it makes sense to pay that penalty when you put the item into the list. Uh, so you're going to put it into the right spot based on priority level. In other words, you're going to keep your list sorted. So you're going to have to walk the list when you put an element into it uh, in order to find the right spot to put it in. Uh, but then when you're ready to dequeue, uh, you just take the first element uh, because the, the, it's already sorted uh, by priority level. Okay, and, and last class we gave a couple examples of, of why you might use one or the other. Uh, what we're going to talk about this class is uh, using a binary tree to kind of get the best of both worlds. Okay, so here if, if you look at in particular just these two operations right here, you'll see that in queue is fast, DQ is slow. We can swap it. We can make in queue slow and DQ fast. What a heap's going to allow us to do is kind of uh, balance those out. Okay, so we're going to do something in the middle where in queuing uh, is between uh, one and n. It's going to take log n time, and dequeuing is also going to take log n time. And the key thing to remember here is if you think sort of visually, uh, this is O1. You know, this is O n, and uh, log n is a lot closer to O1 than it is to O n. Okay, so this is actually a pretty reasonable trade off uh, that we can make uh, if we can arrange this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take um, our values and we're going to put them in a binary tree. And the binary tree is going to have a couple properties. And to understand these properties, it's, it's just easiest to just look at an example. OK, so this is an example of something that is already a heap. So in every node, what we have is uh, a key and a value. So this is a tree of characters. Uh, so C, A, K, X, J, these are the, this is the data that's being stored. So you can think of that as an object of any type uh, that you want to store. And uh, the, the number, the integer that comes before it is the key. As we mentioned, the key doesn't have to be an integer. It can be any object as long as the object can be compared uh, to each other. And uh, what you want to do in a priority queue is you want to pull the smallest value. OK, so you want to pull the smallest key. OK, uh, and so anyway, so this is the heap data structure. So we have everything arranged here in a binary tree. and this binary tree is going to have a couple properties, OK? Uh, so the first property that it's going to have is it's going to be a full or uh, sometimes we use the term a complete binary tree, OK? So this will be a complete OK, what does that mean? What it means is as we fill the nodes in, we fill up every level. You can think of it as sort of left to right. Um, and so we don't start adding nodes down here until we've added all the nodes at this particular level. OK, so we fill up a, a complete level. Uh, and then once we have a complete level, uh, then we move on to the next level. OK, um, we can think of it as left to right. Uh, I'll tell you that there, there is no order. Like, for example, if we switched the subtree that's here with the subtree that's here, uh, if we just swap them in terms of left, right, it would still be the exact same heap. So the heap doesn't actually care about, there's no notion of left to right, okay? There will be a notion of up to down though, uh, but we'll get to that in a second, okay? So a complete binary tree, uh, we can think of a, a more formal way of putting it, um, but basically uh, every level has the maximum number of nodes.
except possibly uh, the, the last level. Uh, which is full left to right. So this is sort of an informal definition. If you want to see something a little more formal, you can look at the textbook. Uh, the textbook definition isn't, isn't actually that much more formal. Okay, uh, so every level is full except for the last one. The last one could be full, right? So if we add two more nodes uh, to this tree, then it would be full. but. Uh, it might not be full, okay? So the only level that's allowed not to be full is the last one. In other words, we can't have an unfull level above it. And uh, the last uh, level will look, uh, it will at least be full left to right. Okay, so that's the first value. Uh, the second value, or the second property of a heap is that it's gonna be a sort of semi-sorted uh, data structure. And the sorting is going to be very simple. It just says that every parent, if you have a parent and two children or one child, um, the parent will be bigger than the child. Okay, so four is, or sorry, smaller rather. Um, so four is smaller than five and it's also smaller than six. Okay, the fact that five is on the left and six is on the right and five is smaller than six, that, that is, that's just a coincidence. So you can find other places in the tree where uh, the bigger value is to the left and the smaller value is to the right. So we don't care about left child or right child. There's no sorting in terms of left child, right child. Uh, the only sorting that we have is from parent to child. Okay, so uh, in other words, if you, if you look at any sort of, we'll do this a lot. We're gonna look at kind of three node pairs. We're gonna look at the parent and its two children, okay? And of those three values, we're gonna say, which one's the smallest? And we're gonna put the smallest one up here. And then we don't care about the other two. They can be in, in either place here, okay? So that's an operation that, that we're, we're gonna do a lot uh, when we start dealing with heaps, but we'll save that for a second. Okay, so it's a semi-sorted data structure. Uh, every parent node has a smaller key than its children. Okay, so as long as you have these two conditions met, uh, so when I look at this, uh, if you go through every node, you'll see that every parent is bigger, or sorry, smaller than its two children. And you also see that it's complete. Then I say this is a heap. Okay, so this is, this is a heap. Uh, now, for every set of data, you could have multiple different heaps. For example, if we swapped 11S and 13W here, the result of that is a different tree, right? Uh, but it's, it's, it's also a heap. And it's also a heap of essentially the same data. Okay, so there's, uh, for, for one set of data, there could be multiple heaps. Uh, there's multiple ways of, of having it. Uh, so a, a heap is, is one example where both of these two properties hold uh, for a particular tree. Now, as a consequence of this tree being both full and binary, meaning there's at least, or sorry, at most uh, two children for every node, we can actually say something uh, about how many nodes we can fit into a tree of a certain height. We can mathematically relate the height of the tree to the number of nodes, right? So for example, uh, if we have a tree of height zero, uh, we can only store one node in that tree. Uh, if we have a tree of height one, uh, we need to have more than one node, okay? One node, we need to have at least two uh, but we could have three as well. So we could have somewhere between two and three uh, nodes. Okay, in order to have four, for, in order to have something of height two, uh, because we're filling it uh, according to the complete rules, we need to have at least four nodes. If we have any less, then the three nodes have to be in this position, this position, and this position. Okay, we couldn't have four nodes down 
this, this line, for example, because then we would have an incomplete level here and an incomplete level here and an incomplete level here. So the properties of the tree say that it has to be complete at every level except for maybe the last one. Okay, so the only way to get something, uh, to get a tree uh, that's going to have a height 2 or to have some nodes here at the third level, uh, we have to have at least four nodes. Okay, there's no way to do it with anything less. And we can have at most, uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nodes. Okay, and uh, once we have eight nodes, we're going to spill over onto the next line. Okay, and so if you look at these numbers, uh, you can see there's sort of a minimum and a maximum, and you can see they follow powers of two. Uh, so this is two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, and these are powers of the two minus one. Um, so this is two to the two minus one. This is two to the three minus one. So in general, uh, what we're going to do is uh, the minimum that we can store is going to be two to the i, uh, where i is the level of the tree or the height of the tree. Uh, let's call it h instead. Okay, and the biggest number will be two to the h plus one, the next power of two minus one. Okay, now these plus ones and minus ones, they're not that important um, to, to, to keep track of, but anyways, the idea is just to get this intuition that uh, what you're storing, if you have a tree of a certain height, you can store an exponential number of nodes uh, in that tree of that particular height. You can also flip that around and you can say, I have a certain number of nodes, what's the height of my tree? Uh, so if you flip it, you're going to move the h to the other side and you're going to get a logarithm. Okay, so I'll, I'll write the property in terms of relating the number of nodes to the height, but you can invert it uh, if you want. Um, so I'm not going to prove this. You can look at the textbook uh, for the proof. Uh, but anyways, if you have a heap of n nodes, the height of the tree will be the log base 2 of n. And uh, this may not be a clean value. And so what we'll do is we'll take the floor of the value. It might not be an integer value, depending on what n is. Uh, so we'll take the floor of that. Uh, and then that will give us the height. OK, and then you can flip it around to figure out the relationship between n and h. OK, the next thing that we're going to consider is how do we add something to the heap? So we have this heap, it's already in this heap data structure. I have a new node that I wanna add uh, to this heap. And so what's the process for adding it? Do I, have to, do I have to completely change the whole data structure, right, in order to fit a new node in? So you can see that um, maybe I just put that new node here, but that may not be a heap anymore, right? It depends a lot on whether the value that I'm adding is greater or smaller than 20. If I add a value and it's smaller than 20, Sorry, if it's greater than 20. Um, if it's greater than 20, then I can just add it here and I'm done, okay? But if it's smaller than 20, it's violating that heap property. And so I'm gonna to have to change some other nodes in order to add it. So the big question that we have is, how many nodes do we have to change, right? Worst case, how many nodes do we have to change in order to add something uh, to the heap? So let's uh, consider this exact example. So I'll make a copy of it here. And um, let's say that the, the node will follow the textbook. And so let's say, say we have a new node. Um, and the new node that we want to add is two T. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So the first thing is we know the size of the resulting heap, okay? So let's start with the first property, which is that this has to be a complete binary tree. The only way this can be a complete binary tree is if a node ends up here, okay? We don't know that it's necessarily going to be this node, but there is going to be a new node here, okay? So the nodes themselves might get rearranged, but we know that when we're done all the rearrangement, this is at least the shape of the tree. So the size of the tree will look exactly like this. Okay, so we're going to add a new node here. And what we're going to do is we're going to, there's different algorithms for doing it, but, but anyways, this is the, the most, the simplest one. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to put uh, 2 to t here at first. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start swapping nodes uh, based on, 
uh, this value here, okay? So the way we're going to do it is uh, when we have this node, this node is, is potentially in the wrong spot, okay? To confirm whether it's in the right spot or the wrong spot, we only have to look at its parent. We know the rest of the tree is already a heap, so we don't have to look at the rest of the tree. This is the only thing that we change. Um, so we only look at its parent. So at the first glance, what we're going to do is we're going to consider what's inside of this relationship. And we notice that 2t is smaller than 20t. So this is violating our heap assumption, okay? So to fix it, what we're going to do is we're simply just going to swap these two elements, okay? So we're going to get rid of this. We're going to put 20b down here, and we're going to get rid of this, and we're going to put 2t up here, okay? Now these two nodes are in the correct order, okay? We haven't touched the rest of the tree, so it's still a heap, okay? But uh, because we changed this node, this node has to have a relationship with its own parent, okay? Uh, so we do have to consider the parent of this node because we changed it. Because we changed this node, we have to consider its parent. So the next thing we do is we look at this set of nodes, okay? And so we see that uh, in this case, the smallest, uh, the smallest of these three values needs to be at the parent node. So that's currently not the case. Uh, at the parent node, we have a six and at the child, we have a two. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to swap these two again. Um, so we'll move the six Z down. And we'll move the two T up here, okay? Now notice the 2t is smaller also than the zq. Um, and that's fine, that, that will always be the case because this was a heap originally, right? So the only time this node gets moved up to this node is when it's smaller than this value. And this val the original value that was here has to be smaller than here, otherwise it wasn't a heap to begin with, okay? So the fact that we don't have to touch this node is always gonna be the case. If we don't have to touch this node, then all of its children are fine as well. Okay, if it was a heap before, we haven't changed it. Uh, and so all of its children are gonna be the same. So we don't have to consider any of this subtree below. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is uh, we change this node, okay? Oh, and the other thing too is we did change this node. Okay, so we moved a bigger value to here, okay? So we should consider whether this bigger value has an influence on the children of the value here, okay? So we went from 2t to 6t, uh, or sorry, 6z. Uh, 6z is bigger than 20b, uh, so we don't have to do any uh, changes below uh, this particular node. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna move up the tree one more level. So we made a change to this node, so we have to consider the consequences uh, for the node above it. So we're going to consider these three nodes. 2t is the smallest value of these three nodes. It has to go at the top. We have to do something with 4c, so we'll swap it into this position. Okay, 4c is still the smallest value of 7t, 7q, and 6z. So this whole subtree and all of its children are fine. And uh, 5a we didn't touch. Okay, and because this number only got smaller, it didn't get any bigger, uh, we know that this value will still continue to be bigger and all of, if this was a heap before, then uh, the whole subtree that's rooted at this uh, will continue to be a heap as well. Okay, so the final uh, tree that we have is we have 2t at the top, uh, we have 4c here, we have 6z here, and we have 20b down here. Okay, and essentially what we did is, if you kind of zoom out or, or sort of stare at this, you'll see that what we did is we really only touched the path of the tree, okay? So if we ask ourselves, how many nodes did we actually have to look at the value of in order to make some sort of decision? You can see that the nodes follow kind of the path of the new node that you added, okay? So it goes up the tree, we consider the neighbor, goes up the tree, we consider the neighbor here, okay? And we know something about the path length, right? The path length uh, from the parent node to any leaf node is going to be the same as the height of the tree, or you can think of it as the depth of a particular node. 
Um, and we know that that in a binary tree is always going to be logarithmic. So the size of this path is going to be the logarithm of the number of nodes that are stored in the tree. Okay, so this is really, really good news because what it says is that uh, we don't have to change the whole tree around. Uh, if we want to add a new node to the tree, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to change something that's sort of proportional to the logarithm of the number of nodes that we have. So if we have a tree with a thousand nodes, then we're only going to have to change log two of a thousand nodes or potentially change them or at least look at them to decide whether we have to change them or not. Okay, so this is what's going to enable us to achieve an enqueuing. So that's what we just did is we just enqueued an element uh, and we're going to be able to do it in log n time. Okay, now we're not sure how we're going to dequeue yet. So we're, we know that this is sort of ordered. And I think if you look at it, it's pretty obvious that the smallest number is still going to be at the root node, but we, we do have to address that. Uh, situation. But anyways, if we add something to a queue, it definitely takes O log n. Uh, and if I promise you that there's some way to dequeue this that also takes log n, uh, then you'll believe that a heap implements a priority queue and it has these two uh, time bounds. So let's get some of these properties written down and, and some terminology as well. Okay. Um, so this whole process uh, we call up heap bubbling. Okay, so we uh, can insert into a heap by up heap bubbling. Uh, insertion takes O n sorry, O log n time. Okay, and let's think about why that's the case. So you can think of how many of these green, there's, there's actually two things that, that we wanna go over. So the first question is how many uh, things did I shade in green? So we passed in the whole path length. We know the path length is log n. And then for every node, we also have the left, kind of the left neighbor that we're also looking at. Uh, when we consider these nodes, okay? And so the first question I have, uh, I, I want to answer two questions. The first is, uh, when I described this, I, I was trying to make it super convenient uh, in terms of the description, and I overstated the things that we actually have to look at, okay? So the first question is, do we even have to look at this left node? Okay, that's one question. And the other thing is, I mentioned that when we moved, for example, originally we moved 6C down, I mentioned, well, you have to check that against its children again, okay? So what that means is that these green lines, you might visit more than once, okay? So let's, let's ask ourselves whether both of those are true or not. So the first question is, do we have to look at the left child? So because this diagram is kind of messy, let's just concentrate on the, the top case, okay? So the top case we had, originally we had 2T here right before we made the switch, and we had 4C up here, okay? Uh, and then we said we have to swap them, okay? So what we're doing is we're taking a smaller value and we're moving it up. We're taking a bigger value, we're moving it down. And when we move a smaller value up to the top, do we care about this value here? Well, originally this value had to have been bigger than this value, otherwise it wouldn't have been a heap. Because this value is bigger than this value and you replace this value with something that's even smaller, then the new heap will still have this node being larger than this node here. In other words, there's no, there's no way to move a smaller node into this that where this node actually becomes smaller on one hand, on the other hand, it becomes bigger than this node, right? A node either becomes smaller or it becomes bigger. It can't become smaller and become bigger than this at the same time. So what that means is we can actually eliminate from our consideration all these neighbor nodes. We, we literally only have to look at the exact path. The second thing is, do we have to look at the path more than once? For example, when we move 2t up here, we moved 4c down here. Okay, when we move 4c down here, is there any chance that because this is now 4c, that the children uh, will no longer be a heap? Okay, that, that will violate the heap property with the children? The answer is that every single node 
that's below 4C, okay? That's this node, this node, this node, this node, this node, and this node. All of those nodes were already underneath 4C before we started, okay? 4C used to be up here, which was actually at the top of the tree. So every node in the tree was already under it, okay? And so when we move these nodes down, when we swap these two, all the nodes that are underneath it were already underneath it anyways, okay? So when we swap it down, we don't actually have to go back and check the subtree, okay? So what we can do is the algorithm can literally only consider, we add the node here, we only consider these exact two nodes, and we ask ourselves, are we swapping or not? Then we consider these two nodes, and we ask ourselves, are we swapping or not? Then we consider these two nodes and we ask ourselves, are we swapping or not, okay? And if we do swap, we don't have to check it for further consistency back down the chain. The other thing is you might not go all the way to the top. So in this case, the, the node that we added actually happened to be smaller than the entire tree. So it up bubbled, it bubbled up to the very top. If at any point you're comparing two nodes and you realize you don't have to swap, then you can just stop, okay? So you don't have to do this swap necessarily all the way to the top of the tree, but at worst case, you will have to do it up to the top of the tree, okay? So all of this means that insertion takes not only sort of big O log n, it, it, it actually, you know, in the worst case, it's going to take something that's very, very close, uh, almost tightly bound to uh, log n time. Okay, so insertion takes log n time. Now let's think about removing an element. Okay. And in particular, since we've, we're trying to implement a priority queue, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to further refine remove where we're not just going to take any element, we want the minimum. Okay. So we want the minimum element of the tree. So let's put our tree back in. And first off, let's note one, one property. Okay. Because this is a heap, what that means is every parent is smaller than its children. What does that mean about the root of the tree? What that means is the root has to be the minimum, okay? If there was some node that was smaller than the root, the only place for it is below it in the tree, and that's going to violate the property that uh, the parent is always bigger than the children, right? You can't have a smaller child somewhere down the tree. Like, for example, let's say that this was 2Q instead of 7, that's smaller than the minimum. Well, as a consequence, there's going to be some violation of the heap property. So right here, you can see it right away. Uh, six is bigger than two, so two's in the wrong place. Even if two was up here, two smaller than four, okay? Um, so the minimum of the tree, or the minimum of the heap uh, is always going to be at the top, okay? So uh, minimum Okay, so let's say we want to get rid of this. So we're going to output, we grab this value um, and we give it to the user, that's great. So they now have 4C. Okay, so this value is gone. It's no longer in our tree. Now, that's great. Uh, so we were able to do remove min in constant time. Uh, but the problem is we don't have a heap anymore, okay? And so if the user comes back another time and asks for the minimum, then we're stuck, right? We can't, we don't know. And because there's no left, right order here, you know, we, we don't know what to give them. So what we're going to do is uh, whenever someone runs remove minimum, even though we can give them the minimum right away, we're going to spend some amount of time reorganizing the heap so that it, it's a heap again, okay? So we grab the minimum, we give it to them right away, and then we spend some amount of time putting this back into the heap data structure, okay? So what does it mean for a data structure, a binary tree to be a heap? One is it's full, and second is that every parent is smaller than its children, okay? Uh, this is no longer a full tree, right? We're missing a node up here, and we kind of have one extra node here, okay? Because we removed the node, we have to make the tree smaller. So what we're going to do is, since uh, we have to fill up the last row left to right anyways, this is the node that's gonna to have to go, okay? So we're gonna to have to get rid of this node. So when, we're, when everything's said and done, there's not going to be a node that's sitting here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the value that's in this node that we're getting rid of. We have a node here, but we have no value for it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop 
it temporarily into the root node. Okay, so we return the root node to the user. We take the leftmost node, the node that, that we're gonna get rid of when we make the tree one node smaller, and we put it up here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do the exact same kind of process that we did before, uh, where instead of starting with a leaf node and sort of up bubbling uh, a node, what we're going to do is we're going to start with it at the top and we're going to down bubble it. Okay, we're going to move it to the right position downward. Now notice that if you take something at this level, this is bigger than this node, and this node's bigger than this node, and this node's bigger than this node. So when you move this leaf node up here, it's it's almost you know certainly going to be bigger than its two children. It actually has to by necessity. So we're going to have to spend some work finding the right home in the tree for this particular node. But let's think about what the algorithm is. So the algorithm is just the same as that upheaping uh, algorithm that we saw, uh, but we're going to kind of do it in reverse. And at every point, we're only going to consider three nodes. Okay, so we're going to consider this node, we're going to consider its two children, and we're going to fix these three nodes. Okay, so 13w is um, the biggest value, uh, 5a is the next smallest, and 6, or small, 5a is the smallest, and 6z uh, is in between. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we have to move 5a up. Okay, we need the minimum, the smallest one up here. So we're gonna get rid of this. Uh, the top node is gonna to become 5a. And then the 13w we can stick, and notice we don't care about left to right sorting. Um, so we could put 13, the, the easiest thing is just to put 13w here uh, and then leave this one alone. If we really wanted to, we could put 13w over here and put 6z over here. There's no, that doesn't violate the, the heat property, but uh, we're not going to do that in this case just because it's 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 more complicated. Why why do something that's that's more complicated when the simple thing will will suffice? Okay, so we considered uh, these three nodes. Uh, we found the smallest of the three nodes. We moved it up uh, here, and then we took what was here and we swapped it down. Okay, because we didn't touch six Z, we know that this whole subtree is fine. Okay, there can't be any uh, violation of of these properties. That's another reason, by the way, not to move 13w here, because if you change all three nodes, then you might have to look at all three subtrees. Um, but anyways, uh, we didn't touch this, so we can ignore this whole subtree, okay? Uh, and so now we're gonna go here and we're gonna do the same process where we're gonna consider these three nodes and ask ourselves, are these three nodes okay? Turns out they're not okay. We have a 9f here that's smaller than the 13w here. It's also smaller than the 15k here. So we're going to get rid of the 9f and we're going to move it up into this node. And we're going to take the 13w uh, that was here and we're going to move it down. Okay, so this is the new tree. So now this is in uh, heap order from in terms of the, just a small, considering these three nodes, these three nodes are now in heap order. We didn't touch this node because we didn't touch it. Its whole subtree is fine. So we don't have to look at that whole subtree. Uh, but we did touch this node, uh, so we have to check its subtree. So we do that by considering the next three nodes. And before I get there, I'll just, I'll just sort of pencil in that when we were considering this box, uh, we considered these two nodes, okay? Then uh, the 13w is larger than the 12h. 12h is the smallest of between 12, 13, and 14. So the three nodes in this uh, subtree. 12 is the smallest, so we're going to move 12 up. So this becomes 12h. And 13w comes down here. Because we didn't touch this node, uh, it's a leaf node anyways, but if it had a subtree, we wouldn't have to look at that subtree. Because this is a leaf node, it has no children, so there's nothing else to consider. Okay, so we're done. And I should note that by the time we got, say we got to here, and let's say that this node, what we bubbled down was actually smaller, then we would just stop. So once again, the fact that this goes all the way to the leaf node is a worst case scenario. Okay, so how much work did this have? So what we did is we looked at the actual path, which we know is log n. Okay, and for every uh, node along the path, we also looked at a neighbor node. So there was log n down, and then there was one neighbor node, one neighbor node, 
one neighbor node as well. Okay, let me draw the neighbor nodes just in a slightly different color. So this was something we considered as a neighbor, this is something we consider as a neighbor, and this is something we consider as a neighbor. Okay, so we have log n purple nodes for every, or purple edges. For every purple edge, there's exactly one blue edge. So that means there's also log n blue edges. Uh, so the whole thing takes two log n. And because of complexity, we get rid of constant terms. So two log n is, uh, is just log n in terms of time complexity. So adding uh, involves touching uh, two log n nodes. So the, the log n that's on the path and the other log n that are the neighbors of the nodes on the path, uh, therefore uh, it is o, n, o log n. Okay, so remove min for a heap runs in O log n, okay? You can actually get the minimum out right away. So it takes constant time to, to actually return the minimum, but the log n is spent rearranging the tree in order to make it a heap, okay? That's important because sometimes you want the value right away, and then maybe you have a window of time where you can sort of rearrange the heap as well, okay? So uh, sometimes you wanna return that value right away uh, to the person, they're gonna go off and, and do it maybe in a parallel thread uh, of your of your computer and uh, then you're going to spend the time between that person asking for the minimum and the next time someone asks for a minimum kind of fixing your heap and putting it back in that heap data structure okay uh, so the idea that you can actually release this right away and then do the re-engineering that's also kind of a hidden property that if you just look at o log n uh, you don't see it it abstracts away uh, that particular property but it actually turns out to be a nice property in practice Okay, uh, the final thing is how do we actually implement this in Java? So what we have here is we're doing this in service of a priority queue. So the priority queue is going to be the big data structure. And what we're going to do is we're going to implement this. Uh, so we looked at options. We could use an array or a positional list uh, uh, here, well, actually, let's let's think of this a, a little more abstractly. So, um, uh, let let me back up and, and re explain this slightly different. So, we have a priority queue, and priority queues are going to store elements uh, of an abstract data type. And because we have keys as well uh, with a priority uh, queue, let's denote it like this. Uh, so, we have a key, and we have some abstract data type. That's what's actually getting stored in the priority queue. We're gonna have an interface uh, that sits here and enforces that certain properties are owned. So if we swap out the details of the priority queue, it doesn't matter. Now the object here is how are we gonna, we have these, these, these tuples, right? This, this value, this pair of values, where are we going to store them? We have to store them in some underlying data structure. And here the underlying data structure itself will have underlying data structures. So the underlying structure here, we have two options. One is we can use some sort of list, right? Like for example, a, a positional list. Let me just describe it as a positional list. Or we could have it as a binary tree. And then if you go back to the binary tree, we have the exact same kind of diagram. Right? We're putting some abstract data types into the binary tree. We have an interface that specifies what a binary tree looks like. And then we have some decisions to make about what's the actual inner data structure of the binary tree. Right? Is this going to be a simple array, for example, or is it going to be a linked tree? Okay, so uh, we have a priority queue that wraps up a binary tree and a binary tree that wraps up, for example, an array or a linked tree. Okay, so we, we know how to do everything here, right? Uh, we just don't know how to do this here. So what are we going to choose between these two? So this is just revisiting past discussions, but what we said is arrays are always faster. With the linked tree, you're creating nodes. Nodes are objects. Nodes uh, dealing with objects, you know, takes a little bit more 
than dealing with a, a, a raw sort of data type like an array. The problem with array is that you have to fix its capacity. But then we said, well, we have this fancy dynamic arrays where we can double the capacity every time that we need it. And if we amortize the, the price of adding and resizing, it turns out to be linear time anyways, worst case. So uh, link, uh, a, a, an array with dynamic uh, resizing usually is going to be better than a link tree for, for most basic operations like adding and removing uh, from the data structure. Okay. The other problem with the array is uh, if your tree's not full, then it gets kind of sparse, where you have a bunch of uh, nodes that are sitting in the array, and then you have some empty space, and then you have more nodes, and you know that, that gets a little bit complicated. But here, with a heap, what's really nice is we have this property where it's going to be full. Okay, The tree has to be full. So if we take this tree and we store it in a simple array, what we're going to end up with is an array that's going to be full uh, from left to right. So anyways, it doesn't matter how you implement your priority queue and then your heap. Um, there's going to be different performance consequences. Uh, but anyways, let's just consider the one uh, case where uh, we're going to implement our priority queue. Uh, we're going to implement it using a binary tree. And the binary tree, in turn, we're going to implement using a simple array. Okay, So this is one nice kind of configuration uh, that, that's going to work for us. Okay, so we'll consider a heap via a binary tree object. And the binary tree object itself is going to use a simple array uh, to, to store the underlying data in the tree itself. Okay, so if we do all of this, this is sort of what we get uh, as a result. Okay, so this is the same tree. Um, so every tree has an index. And we put the index in here. Uh, I'll note that, that in this case, the binary tree is positional. So we can return uh, this position, uh, which would be the index of this particular node, so 9f. And the other thing we want to do is, let's say I have a pointer to 9f. So I go to 9f. So I'm sitting here and I'm looking at 9f. I want to figure out where is its parent. right? I want to find out, because say I'm, I'm up bubbling, so I have to find its parent to make that comparison. So where is its parent? So its parent's 5a is at 1. But how do I know that if I'm looking at this, this node in the array that I have to move over 3 to the left to find its parent? Or conversely, if I want to find its children, I'm going to have to move over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for one child. I'm going to have to remove over 6 to find its other child. Um, you know, how, how do I figure that out? So it turns out that there is uh, some basic math that we saw uh, for binary trees um, that make this whole thing work. Um, so uh, just as a, as a reminder, we drew this out uh, before, but if I have a node, and let's say my node is at position i, uh, if I want to find the parent of the node, uh, the parent of the node uh, is always going to be at i minus 1 over 2. Uh, if this is an even number, that, then that will be an integer. If it's an odd number, it's not going to be an integer, so we'll take the floor uh, of that value. And if we want to find the children, the children are going to be side by side in the tree. One of them is going to be at 2i plus 1, and the other one's going to be at 2i plus 2. OK, so you can stare at this and convince yourself uh, that uh, this is correct. Um, but anyways, what it does is it lets us traverse the tree very, very easily, very cleanly, uh, always in constant time operations, uh, never having to do anything where we have to traverse the tree in order to uh, actually make this work. So the time complexity of using a heap will look like this. Assuming we keep a variable around, a uh, helper variable that keeps track of every time we do an insert or a remove, uh, we'll have the size uh, in constant time. If we want to peek at the minimum value, not actually remove it, we know the minimum is at the top of the tree. So uh, we can peek at it. Uh, the, the only cost is, is that rearranging the tree when we remove the minimum. So we can peek at the minimum in constant time. But if we want to actually remove it, then we're going to, like I said, you're going to return the minimum value in constant time. Uh, but then you're going to spend log n time uh, rearranging the table. Where does the log n come from? Two places. One is it's the path length 
of the tree, uh, which is all the nodes that you have to rearrange along the path of the tree. And then the other thing that's put here, the star, is if we implement it the way that we suggested with this array, notice that if we add, say, a 13th element here, we're going to have to make this array bigger. We don't have a, a bigger size, okay? But if we do a dynamic array where we double every time we get out of, uh, we get out of room, um, then that turns out to be inserting into that type of array is um, you don't pay a penalty for it when you amortize away uh, the, the fact that you're resizing it, okay? Um, so in other words, we're going to ignore the fact that we're using a dynamic array, and so it's going to be log n. Uh, inserting is going to be the same. Uh, so inserting, uh, we add a node at the, the bottom of the tree, and then we have to kind of percolate up the changes along the path length of the tree, uh, which is log n as well. Um, so this is the time complexity of all the different algorithms. We don't need to create any helper variables or anything in order to do this. Uh, so when we think of the, the memory complexity of all these algorithms, everything we're doing is in place, okay? So we might have to swap two nodes, but we have uh, positions for those two nodes. At worst, we might have a temporary variable, just we'll move in order to, to swap two nodes, we'll move one into the temporary, we'll move the other one up, and then we'll move the temporary into the other node. Um, but we, we don't have to introduce um, any new data structures uh, in order to make sure, to, in order to implement uh, any of these. So it has good memory complexity as well. Um, so this is the heap data structure. Now, there's one other property that a heap has, um, and that's how do you get it in the first place? Uh, so we looked at, um, what happens when you have a heap already and you want to add a single element to it? You can do that in log n time. Uh, and so one, one way of, of constructing a heap is uh, just add, uh, you know, if you, if you have, let's say you want to create, well, let's say you want to create this heap here. Uh, you have 12 elements, uh, 13 elements in the heap. So you can run insert uh, 13 times, okay? So you can run insert n times to make a heap of n items. Okay, how much does this cost? Um, so you're running it n times, so it's going to be n times the cost of an insert. What's the cost of the insert? Well, the cost of the insert is log n. Okay, so it's going to be n times log n, or n log n. So that's the ho the cost of constructing a heap if you insert, uh, uh, run insert n times. And so the question is, is there a faster way? And it turns out there is, otherwise I wouldn't be asking the question. Um, and so it turns out that you can amortize anyways. You can actually construct it in linear time. Um, okay. Notice that you're never going to get sublinear because in order to insert n items, you have to touch n items. Okay. So it's, it's never going to be less than O n. Okay. Uh, at worst, we have one method that's O n log n. So the only question is, can we reduce O n log n to O n? Um, and it turns out the answer is yes. Uh, the algorithm that we use we call uh, bottom-up heap construction. And uh, this is going to be useful uh, not only when you deal with heaps themselves, um, but there's things you can do with heaps. Uh, you can use a heap as a kind of primitive that lets you run other algorithms on top of it. Uh, the best example of this is sorting. So if you want to sort, you can kind of put everything in a heap using this linear time construction. And then uh, if you pull the minimum uh, every single time, uh, then you're going to get a sorted list. You're going to get sorted from the smallest element uh, to the largest element. Um, so this is that's sort of where we're going. But anyways, let's just consider this question in isolation. Uh, how do we, we have 100 items and we want to make a heap. Uh, how do we do that in, uh, in constant time? 
And before we get there, I want to make a, a, an observation. Okay, let's say that we have, um, let's say we have a little tree. Uh, actually, let's say that we have uh, two heaps. Let's say we have two heaps uh, that already exist and we have one new element that we want to add. So that's the input and the output we want is a single heap of, of all of these. Okay, so all the elements are that are in heap one, all the elements in heap two, plus the one new element. Okay, so this, this maybe sounds a little weird, but let, let me draw it out in terms of a picture. So um, let's say we have a heap that looks like this. So 15, 16, 25. And then over on the side, we have a totally different heap. It looks like four, nine, and 12. And let's say that we have a new piece of data, which we'll call five. And so we want to put five into the heap. Okay, so that's, that's our goal. Okay, so these are the inputs. Okay, how can we do this? So it turns out what we can do is we can put five at the top. It's going to be the node that sort of merges the two heaps together. Okay, so now we have a proper binary tree. It's a full binary tree. It's not, it doesn't necessarily have the heap property. Um, and because this is the only node that we changed, at this point, it's actually no different than when we removed a node and we took the leaf node and we moved it to the top. Okay, so we have a new top node. So what we have to do is we have to rearrange the tree all the way down. Okay, so we do the down uh, bubbling method. So we look at these three values. Uh, we see that five, 15, and four, the smallest one is four. So we're gonna move four up here and we'll put five here. Didn't touch this, don't have to look at its subtree. Uh, five is the smallest of nine and 12, so then we're done. Okay, so that's it. Um, so to um, merge two trees or two heaps, uh, we add a new element We add a new, I'll, I'll describe it as a root. And uh, we down heap, uh, we down bubble uh, the changes to the heap. Okay. And down bubbling will take at worst log n time. Okay. So now let's consider the bottom up construction. And what we're going to do in bottom up is we're actually going to. Uh, we're going to build our tree uh, such that uh, when we build our tree, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to basically repeat this operation. We're going to make little trees and then we're going to take our little trees and make them into a bigger tree. And then we're going to keep repeating that uh, over and over and over again. Okay. But let me just show this through an example. It's probably the easiest way. So let's assume that we have 15 elements and we know what they all are ahead of time. Okay, let me uh, just write them out for, for record. So we have uh, these elements and we want to put them into a heap, okay? So we have 16, 15, 4, 12, 6, 7, 23, 20, 25, 9, 11, 17, five, eight, and 14. Okay, and this is just a completely unsorted list of integers. And this are the keys. So uh, for every key, there is associated value. Just for simplicity, I'm gonna drop that value. So we, we won't consider the objects that are actually being stored. These are just the keys. Um, 
okay? And so what we want to do is we want to construct a, a heap, okay? Now, if we count up the number of elements, we have 15. So we can figure out the size of the tree that we need to store it. Um, so in this case, what we're going to need is a tree of height three, okay? So what that means is the base layer is going to have eight nodes. Uh, you know, the, the level above it will have uh, two nodes, uh, sorry, four nodes, the level above it will have two, and then the top of the tree will have a single node, okay? Um, so, so the tree will look like we can sense, sort of pencil in what the tree will actually look like, and I'm going to spend a little time to try and actually draw this correctly. Okay, so if I did a good job, that's what the tree will look like. Um, so all these elements are going to fit into a tree that looks like this. Now, as the name of the algorithm implies bottom up, we're going to fill these in bottom up. Um, so we have eight nodes along the bottom. So what we're going to just put in the first eight nodes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so these are the nodes that we're going to put in the tree initially. So we'll make this um, 16, 15, uh, 4, 12, 6, 7, 23, Okay, and uh, now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to fill in the next uh, level of the tree. Um, so let's just take the next element. So the next element is 25. Okay, so we put 25 here. Now notice that this subproblem, what we did is we, when you have a single node, it's technically a heap. A single node is a heap. So we kind of had two heaps and then we're joining them together with a new node. Okay, so we have this, this heap and this heap. And that's exactly the algorithm that we just did up here. So we're going to do this algorithm over and over and you'll, you'll kind of get the hang of it uh, when you see it. But anyways, what we're going to do is we, we just put this in. So we're going to consider um, these three values here. Okay, and we're going to make sure that the smallest one's at the top. Okay, so we'll put the 15 here and we'll put the 25 down here. Okay, now this whole thing is a heap. Okay, so that's, that's great. Uh, then we have four and 12. Uh, we'll grab our next element, which is nine. Uh, we'll consider this small uh, heap here. So we have nine, four, 12. The smallest one's four, so we're gonna put the four up here and we're gonna put the nine down here. Okay, then we're gonna repeat that. Um, let's see if I can get this all on the same screen. Uh, so we'll put 11 up here. And uh, let, me, let me just actually fill in all the values in this row. 17 here. Okay, so here the smallest is 6. So put the 6 here and we'll put the 11 here. And here 17 is actually smaller than these three values, so we don't have to touch uh, that particular thing. Okay, so now what do we have is we have kind of like four mini heaps. This is a heap, this is a heap, this is a heap, and this is a heap. We're going to take our next uh, element, uh, which is a 5 and an 8. And when we put a 5 here, we're, we're really taking one heap and another heap and a new element five and we're merging them together. Okay, so we're gonna use that same algorithm. So we put the five here and we say, uh, what's the smallest of its three kids? Or sorry, of its two kids. So we have a 15, a four and a five. So the four is the smallest. So we're gonna put the four up here and we're gonna take our new five and we're gonna put it here. Okay, because we changed this node, we've gotta make sure that we're not gonna change anything along here. Uh, so we have nine, 12 and five, so that's fine. Then we grab our eight. Our eight is, uh, so six is smaller than eight. So we'll move this and we'll make that eight. And we'll make this a six up here. Then we have to check this subtree. And so because uh, this was a six, which was smaller than seven, but now we put an eight here and eight is bigger than seven. So seven is the smallest now. So we gotta move the seven back up and move the eight down. Okay. so. Uh, every time we touch a node, we might have to touch a whole path of the tree. Okay, then finally we have one node left. So notice that we have a heap. So this whole data structure here is a heap. This whole data structure here is a heap. And we have a new node 14. And so we're, we're merging the two heaps using a new common node. Okay, and then we're going to do the same process. So 4, 14, and 6, 4 is the smallest of the three. So 4 goes in the root and 14 goes here. 14, 15, 5. 
5 is the smallest, so 5 will end up here, and a 14 will go here. 14, 12, 9. 9 is the smallest, so we're going to move our 14 here, and uh, we're going to move our, our 9 up here. Okay, and then we're done. Uh, so this is this is a heap data structure. Okay. Okay. So the question is, how much time did we spend uh, doing this? So the time complexity of this is it's actually um, maybe a little difficult to to see. So here here's the tree, the funnel tree that we ended up with. Uh, you can ignore the fact that it's blue. Um, and what we're going to do is we're, we're going to consider amortized time. And what I'm going to argue is that this is actually a linear operation. So this is going to take ON. And I'm not going to formally prove it. I'm just going to try and give you the intuition. Okay. So what happened is um, the first for the first step of the algorithm, what we did is we added a bunch of nodes to the root. And then we were done. We didn't have to. We didn't have to change them. Okay, they were already leaf nodes, and every leaf node, uh, before we added any of these other elements above it, every leaf node is itself a heap. Okay, so if you think of the amount of time that we took, uh, that that takes clearly constant time. Um, so we did one plus one plus one plus one, and this is the key insight is. Um, the number of, of operations that we did uh, that, that take constant time, that's actually half of the number of nodes that we're putting in. Half of the nodes end up at the leaf, okay? Um, so this is like n over 2 of the nodes, okay? Now, let's go to the other extreme. So the, these are the nodes that were the quickest to add. At the other extreme, uh, the node that was the hardest to add, the one that took the most time to add, was the root node. Because at the root node, we did have to, at worst case, we're going to have to downheap the changes down a path of the tree. Going down a path of the tree, we already know, takes log n time. So the root node uh, took log n time, but there was only one of them. Okay. So in other words, half of our nodes take constant time, one of our nodes takes log n time, and then everything that's in between, uh, first off, the number of nodes that are in between are in between a half and one, and the amount of time that each of them takes is somewhere between one and log n, okay? Um, so for example, these two, uh, they don't quite take log n uh, because uh, you don't have to, you, you have to go down the whole path of the tree, but you get to skip one level because these are at level two, okay? So they're going to kind of take like log n minus one, you can think of. Okay, and so there's two of these. Uh, conversely, on, on the other side, there's these ones, uh, you basically, like to add the 15 here, you consider three nodes, right? So you consider these three nodes, and then to add the nine here, you consider these three nodes. Uh, to add the seven here, you consider these three nodes, okay? Um, so, sorry, we talked about this. I, I know I'm sort of going inside and out uh, from, from this equation. But here we have a bunch of three. So we have three plus three plus three plus three, okay? And how many of these are, well, if half of our nodes are here, a quarter of our nodes are going to be here, roughly. Uh, this is off by one, but that's roughly the case, okay? So in other words, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that maybe happens in the middle, but you're going to do a whole bunch of constant time operations. These are also constant time uh, operations. And then you're going to do more and more expensive operations, but you're going to do less of them. And eventually the most expensive operation you do is log n, but there's only one log n, which is the root node, okay? So if you add all of this stuff up, uh, you could use a geometric series or something like that. Uh, what comes out the other end is a linear term, okay? Uh, and this kind of makes sense. Well, first off, it has to be at least linear because there's n, there's n things all the way across. Even if it was one plus plus one for all n nodes, that would be linear in and of itself. Um, so so there's, going, there's n terms here. Uh, the only problem is that they are getting a little bigger. And so if all a, n of them were ones, then it would be O n. If all n of them were log n, it would be n log n. 
And so the question is, because uh, we're, we're sort of in between, some of them are closer to one and some of them are closer to log n, when you average everything out, does it end up looking more like one or does it look end up looking more like n, log n? And it, the answer is it ends up looking more like one. Okay, so it looks a lot more like you have n ones than you have n log n's. Okay, so uh, once again, this isn't a proof. This is a very informal kind of hand wavy argument. Uh, even though the textbook doesn't formally prove it, um, but this bottom up heap heap con uh, construction algorithm actually you can do in linear time. Okay, so why does this matter? So this is going to be really great for sorting. Okay, if we want to sort something, what we can do is um, we can take our, our array, which is unsorted, like say we have this array and we want to sort it. Okay, so we're going to take this array. And what we can do is we can take the array and we can put it in a heap. Okay, so now we have a heap data structure. The algorithm that we, we do use to turn this into this is the bottom up construction and it takes o n time. Okay? Then once we have our heap construction, what we can do is we can remove min and we can do that n times. Okay? Uh, and so then we'll get out a sorted array. Uh, let me, I'm not drawing this very well, let me kind of change the way this looks slightly. Um, so we have an array and we go to a heap and then what we actually come what comes out the other end is an array that's sorted okay and so to turn an array into a heap we can use bottom up that takes o n time and then in order to turn the heap into the sorted array we can just do remove min you know, until, until the heap is empty, okay? And so this is going to take n log n time. Okay, so to turn an array into a sorted array, it's going to take o n plus o n log n. And so the whole thing, uh, we call this heap sort because we sort via the heap data structure. Uh, the whole thing ends up being uh, so it's n log n, well, I'll just, I'll write it, n plus um, n log n, which is n log n. And if the whole thing's going to be n log n anyways, why, why do we bother with the bottom up? Why don't we just insert, 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 insert? Then we get n log n plus n log n. So it makes actually no time difference. So the, the fact that we could do this linearly uh, doesn't help us in the overall time complexity, but it, it matters in terms of practical terms, right? The, the faster we can make this, even if this is going to be the slowest operation, if we can make this operation faster, then it still saves us time in the long run, okay? So this is the heap sort algorithm. It runs in n log n time. So that's actually really good, um, I think. Is it good? So that's the question that we have. Is, is n log n a good kind of algorithm for sorting? So how fast should we expect to sort things? So if we're going to sort things, uh, first off, it has to be at least linear. You have to at least touch every element in order to sort it. Okay, so O n is, is the absolute minimum that it could be theoretically. Um, but it's, it's very easy to get something that, that takes a lot more time. Okay, so uh, let's just compare this to other sorting algorithms that are, are easy enough to conceptualize. And then later in this course, we're going to return to this sorting question and, and we'll talk about lots more algorithms. But um, let's just think of two other algorithms for sorting that are just kind of, um, they're kind of easy to, uh, to, to visualize. So the, the first one is uh, what we call selection sort. So basically what you do is you have as your input an array, unsorted array. Uh, you make a new array, okay? So you make new array of the same size but empty. 
Uh, and then for each element, so we'll call this A and we'll call this B. Uh, so for each element of A, uh, you basically walk the entire array A, you find the minimum value, okay, and then you put it into B. You copy it into B, okay? Then, uh, then you move over one index in B, and then you go all the way through A, and then put it into B, and you do this over and over and over again, okay? Um, so for each element of A, we're going to do this operation, okay? So for each of this, we do this, okay? For each element of A, well, there's n of these, okay? So that's going to take n to, to do each element of A. And in order to find the minimum, we have to walk the entire index of the array. The array might get slightly smaller because we, as we pull values out. So the first time we're going to have to look at n values, then n minus 1, then n minus 2. Uh, but we know that, that if you add all of that up, n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 all the way down to 1, it ends up being n. Okay, so for each uh, n times, we're going to do this thing that takes n. Uh, so the whole thing is going to go in O n squared. O n squared is bigger than O n log n by a lot. Okay, this is quadratic. This is, remember, log n's are very close to constant. They're a lot closer to constant. Um, so uh, n, another thing, maybe it's too simpler, simple to even think about, but uh, remember that O n squared is O n times n. So we're going from n times n to n times log n. So we're, we're reducing this second term from an n to a log n uh, when we do heap sort. So that's a huge uh, kind of improvement, okay? Um, the other problem with this is, is notice the memory complexity, right? So this also has O n uh, in terms of memory, okay? In this algorithm, heap sort, um, what, what's the memory complexity of heap sort? Well, we have this, uh, this tree, uh, and this tree takes n, it's of size n as well, okay? Uh, all the sorting and stuff we can do in place, uh, but we do have to create this separate data structure uh, that we're gonna use uh, in order to do uh, this as well. So uh, this is also gonna be O n uh, memory complexity, okay? Uh, so later what we'll do is we'll, we'll ask ourselves, well, if we have an array, can we kind of swap things in place? Uh, then we don't have to create this whole separate data structure, right? So heap sort looks really great. O n log n, I can tell you, is actually a very good complexity for, for a, a sorting algorithm. But the fact that we have to construct this array and use O n memory to, to, to store it, that's not, that's not a good aspect, okay? Um, so, so there's room to improve, even though we've seen heap sort there's still room for new sorting algorithms that, that are maybe a little bit better, and we'll look at those later on in the course. Uh, very quickly, there's another famous algorithm, which is insertion sort. And so in insertion sort, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start with our array, which is unsorted. And then for each uh, element, um, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to kind of take our array and we're going to split it. Uh, so at, at any point in time of, in the middle of running this algorithm, this will be sorted from left to right. This will be unsorted. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this element, the next element over, and we're going to find the right place. Okay, so it's it's going to go somewhere in our sorted array. Okay, then we're going to move over one more, and so we're always going to move the unsorted elements into the sorted side, the unsorted side into the sorted side. But finding the right place here is going to take O n. At least for the very last element, you're going to have to look at the whole list minus one. Um, so it's going to take linear time. Okay, so for each element in A. Uh, we find the right uh, place for it. Uh, 
in the sorted side. Okay, so this, this is just really quickly, I, I'm not formally defining it, but this is going to take n, and this worst case is going to take n. It's going to be n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2, uh, which amortizes out to n. And so this whole thing is going to take on. Uh, the only advantage of it is that you can do the sorting in place. You don't have to create this whole uh, side uh, data structure to hold uh, the sorted data. So um, you can do this in O1 memory. Last but not least, uh, what we did in heap sort is we used priority queue as a kind of data structure. Um, so we had this picture that looked like uh, we had a, an unsorted array. We move it to a priority queue, and then we pull from the priority queue in sorted order. Okay, and so in general, what we can do is we can think about uh, what are we going to have on, how long is this going to take, and how long is this going to take? And in particular, we can go all the way back to here's all the different types of queues that we might have. Okay, and so. Um, if our priority queue is uh, an unsorted priority queue, so that's this is the first case. Okay, then what that means is adding things to it is constant time, so that takes O1. Removing things, uh, so it takes n times O1. Uh, to remove n things, it's going to take n times On, okay? And this is exactly uh, the same as selection sort, okay? Uh, you move all the elements uh, into uh, the array, and then when you pull them back out, uh, you look for the minimum, okay? So this ends up being equivalent to a selection sort, okay? We can use a sorted PQ. Then we're going to get n times o n to add because we're adding in the right spot. Uh, we're going to have n times o one in order to remove, and this ends up being exactly insertion sort, except for we're not even using this trick of of doing an in place sort. We're actually moving all of this to a new data structure, like just making a copy of it, uh, and then when we pull it. Um, Sorry, when we add it to the new data structure, we make sure we add it in the right place. Uh, and then when we pull from it, we can just pull from the start of, of the array. So we just pull it out. Uh, it's already in sorted order, okay? Uh, so pulling it out takes constant time. So this ends up being exactly the same as insertion sort. Okay, and then finally, uh, we could use a heap as our data structure. And in this case, it's going to take uh, O, n log n to, to do n additions, but because we can do the bottom-up heap uh, construction, we can actually get this down to, to uh, o uh, log n, sorry. Sorry, miss misspeaking uh, all over the place here. Uh, to have a heap here, uh, normally we have to add n elements and we might have to do log n work uh, to add an element. That's how much add uh, takes or insert uh, how much insert costs, but with the bottom up, what we can do is we can add them in constant time. Then when we remove them, we have to remove them, but then we have to readjust the heap. And so every time we remove a single element, uh, that readjustment um, takes log n uh, in order to reheapify uh, our tree, and we're doing this n times. Um, and this ends up being exactly equivalent to heap sort. Okay, so this is a generic template where if you have a priority queue, you can always put your array into the priority queue and then pull it back out. It will always get you a sorted array and how long it takes is going to depend on how you implement the priority queue and how long additions to the priority queue and removals from the priority queue take.